Hop in this seat. It's time for... Okay, hop in, sis. Good morning, Senny. How are you today? Good. It's nice to be with you today. We're sitting in the car. Uh, you're my daughter. And how old are you? Seven. What grade are you in? First. What's going on in the world right now? People have to stay in their homes and not really go anywhere. How come? Because the coronavirus is going on. Yeah, and so we're trying to stay safe and keep people healthy, right? Right. And you're doing school from home too, huh? Yes. Has it been fun to have mom and dad home a lot? Yeah. What have, what kind of things have you been doing? Mm, I've pretty much been bored. <laughs> well, we're trying to keep you entertained. Yeah. All right, so I asked if you'd come out to the car here, my little recording studio temporarily, and if you could help me introduce the show. It's the Maxwell Institute Podcast. I'm Blair Hodges. When railroads started making their way across the western frontier of the United States in the 1800s, many Americans believed that it would destroy the religion known as Mormonism. President of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, Brigham Young, disagreed. He declared, I don't care anything for a religion which could not stand a railroad. Indeed, it must be a damn poor religion if it can't stand one railroad. Brigham Young turned out to be right. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints not only survived but flourished in its mountain home, but it didn't emerge from the railroad battles unchanged. In this episode, Dr. David Walker joins us to talk about his latest book, Railroading Religion, Mormons, Tourists, and the Corporate Spirit of the West. It's a more fascinating and even humorous story than you might expect, so stay with us. Questions and comments about this and other episodes can be sent to me at mipodcast at byu.edu. David Walker, welcome to Provo. Welcome to the Maxwell Institute. Glad to be here. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's wonderful. I just finished reading your book, Railroading Religion, Mormons, Tourists, and the Corporate Spirit of the West. I found this book to be really engaging, interesting, and it was taking a new kind of approach. It's a little bit more theoretical than a lot of the history books I've read about the West. Maybe say a word about that before we start. Sure. Well, I appreciate the compliment. Thanks for reading it. Yeah, I mean, I, I work in religious studies, and I've been trained in sort of theories and methods in religious studies. I've been interested always in the ways in which we could sort of reintegrate the history of religion in the American West with the sort of field more broadly of theory and method in religion. I think that they both have the opportunity to speak to each other in more robust ways than we've allowed them to. And how would you differentiate that from just a typical historical approach to the past? Yeah, I mean, this is actually a hard question, right? So so when I went to graduate school, there was a certain sense that historians are actually not interested in sort of theorizing or thinking about theories of religion, but rather like just, just find, tell the story. Yeah, just, yeah. just tell the story, just yeah. find the data. The data could speak for itself, allow it to speak through us. I think that that's, although I understand the stance, and I, but I think it actually represents a certain sort of peculiar understanding of the nature of theory itself as something that's either predictive or prescriptive or alternately perhaps anachronistic in particular ways. So I think whenever you're looking for data to sort of tell a story, you're going into it, you're going into the research process itself with a certain sense of what constitutes data for the purposes of evidence and argumentation and religious studies. That is to say, you are going in already with a certain sense of theory and method in and for religious studies. So I think it makes sense to render that explicit. I think it makes sense to render that explicit in articulation with and in conversation with other sort of historiography of the field. And that's some of what I try to do here. Another way of saying that is that I think that history and historiography are not mutually exclusive fields. In fact, I think they're actually the same thing. History is looking at the process by which we have understood historical data to be such. Yeah, so like histo historiography sort of tells the history of history almost. Correct. Yeah. Do you find, as you're working with students, that it's difficult for them to dive in to the theory? Or how is it at school when you're teaching these things? I don't think it is. I think, I mean, at, a one, at one level, that's a, a sort of that's on us as teachers to figure out how we're actually going to teach this material. And my sort of in-class trick is always to, to articulate and to find people sort of on the ground in their everyday lives theorizing religion in ways that we could sort of compare to classical theories in the field. So it's sort of a classroom trick at a certain level. So for every E.B. Tyler, I will find you a P.T. Barnum. <laughs> for every sort of Max, uh, Max Weber, I'll find you a J.H. Beadle. And some of that is just to sort of show the way that theory itself is operative on the ground all the time in the sort of intense intellectual labors of people themselves going through their everyday lives. Yeah, and we'll talk about 
about Beadle you mentioned. We'll talk about him a little bit later on. But Max Weber is this theorist of religion, very popular in the field, sort of came up with this idea of the Protestant work ethic and, and all these things, very technical. And then Beadle was writing to a popular audience. He was sort of trying to, to tell people what Mormons were about. Yes. And, and, and But he was theorizing religion. He had ideas about what religion was, what proper religion was, what improper religion was, the role of religion in public life. So, But he was speaking – in, in kind of common terms, whereas Weber is going to be, you know, using big words. And, Absolutely. And yeah. So, yeah. so there, it's theory all the way down, whether it's sort of back pocket theory that anybody pulls out or something that, that a scholar has sat down and really hammered through. Yeah, exactly. And again, and then that's part of the project too, is to, to sort of recover theory as not something that is exclusively in and for the academy or the edict stuff of scholars or even sort of uh, lawyers or government agents, but rather to look at, again, the intense intellectual labor done by people on the ground as they themselves sort of contest or intersect with some of the programs that are being implemented elsewhere. Right. Let's let's dive in here to chapter one. So your book is, a, it's called Railroading Religion. It's going to look at the American West. It's going to look at Utah. And by the way, I should say for our listeners, we'll, throughout the episode, sometimes we'll be using Mormon and Mormonism. This is in the historical sense uh, of how people understood themselves and the labels that were used in a book of history. So uh, if anybody has questions about the use of Mormon, that's how we'll be using it in this interview. So I'm going to begin here with Charles Dickens. Charles Dickens, you know, the guy who wrote Great Expectations. I'm talking about the Charles Dickens. He was astonished at the rise of a new prophet in America. He, he was in England. And he heard about Joseph Smith, and he wrote about Mormonism in, in 1851. Here's what he said. Our age, among other curious phenomena, has produced a new religion designated Mormonism and a prophet named Joe Smith. It exhibits fanaticism in its newest garb, homely, wild, vulgar fanaticism, seeing visions in the age of railways. Dickens was amazed that at such an advanced time in history, someone would believe that an angel could give a book of gold plates to a prophet, right? How did Dickens' take on Mormonism fit into broad public opinion about the new religion? Yeah, that's great. So, I mean, Dickens's astonishment, his amazement then at the idea of sort of visions in the age of railroads speaks precisely to some of the, the sort of rising presumptions of the incompatibility of modernity, industrial modernity and capitalism with certain modes of religious expression, right? And so I'm looking at in this book what I call the death knell thesis, which is the idea that circulates in popular venues as well as governmental and political venues that indeed capitalism Protestantism, industry, laissez-faire economics themselves will ultimately derail or render impossible religious movements such as Mormonism. So, so the book then is set up to look at the sort of irony of that presumption, the irony of Dickens's own astonishment at a certain level to say rather, actually, these things are not only not mutually exclusive, but in many ways, railroad industries constructed the Mormonism that we know. Yeah, so people were thinking in this enlightened age, religion will sort of die off. People are going to come to their senses and drop their superstitions. And technology, transportation, all of these things would lead to that. So there was one travel writer in particular that you quote where they said, the first whistle of the locomotive will sound the death knell in Utah. Exactly. How did you hone in on railroads as your focus for this? So why did I hone in on railroads? Well, Part of the answer goes back to when I was starting to sort of articulate and think through the delineations of this project. And I thought that it would be a broader project at a certain level, looking at academies, institutions, uh, land granting institutions, canal systems, a whole bunch of different sort of infrastructural initiatives that may have influence the way that religion was shaped and articulated in the American West. But as anyone knows, once you sort of get into the archives of debate about infrastructure in the 19th century, railroads are the ubiquitous and central point of conversation for pretty much everyone. It is one of the major industrial enterprises and initiatives and interests of 19th century Americans generally, as and it also represented a lot of the political initiatives of the Civil War Congress itself. So you've got then, again, ubiquitous conversations conversations about railroads and their import in a reconstructing West and in a reconstructing nation that will focus on the West itself. You then get people who are talking about railroads, the import that they will have, what they will do to the West, to groups in the West. And in all of these conversations, and many of these conversations, I was shocked to find a sort of pervasive interest in restructuring the nation, the nature of Mormonism itself as well. 
Yeah, and that's kind of the way that it shaped Mormonism then was because it was actually connecting people. Mormonism couldn't be an isolated thing off in the mountains, right? It, right. Railroads connected them to other people and connected other people to them, so they had to interact. And that interaction will change Mormons, change the country, and the country would come to change Mormons, according to the book. Yes, yes. Yeah. So what kind of things were concerning public opinion about Mormonism? If someone says that they had a vision, I mean, that, you know, you could just sort of dismiss that. But why did Mormonism become such a flashpoint? Yeah, so, so again, part of the argument is that Mormonism became especially a flashpoint upon conceptualization of the transcontinental railroad, which would necessarily cross the lands of the West and through the Great Basin. There was then an impetus or requirement then to render intelligible the nature of Mormonism and try to think through, okay, what will that mean as a group that will be reconnected to and indeed placed right along the main line of American transportation and commerce? Yeah, if you're going to be driving through, should you be scared or not? Right, yeah, at a certain <laughs> yeah. level, yes, absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. But the concerns were very much those of theocracy, polygamy, the relationship between church and state, the idea that Mormonism itself sort of instituted a mode of antiquity or pre-modernity that was incompatible with the modernity of America writ large, or at least that which Americans imagined for themselves. Yeah, it's interesting to see the ways that, that you talk about how people would say Latter-day Saints couldn't be good Americans because they had allegiance to a prophet who believed they had revelation from God. So they would privilege that over any kind of law or any kind of national spirit or anything like that. So yeah, so this had, it wasn't just that people were seeing visions that, that troubled people like Charles Dickens. It was also that those visions had implications for where to build a community or, or who to buy goods from or sell goods to, right? So Absolutely. Yeah, so even though a lot of Americans like like Dickens were optimistic that that the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints would wither away, like the dawn of modernity would sort of melt away the frost of uh, uh, of this old religion, they had different opinions about how to make that happen. So let's look at two figures in particular that you look at in chapter one. They sure. felt Mormonism would fade away, but they disagreed about what to do. So let's look at Justin Morrill and William Walters Boyce. Absolutely. So Justin Morrill, who is known as the namesake of the Morrill Anti- Anti-Bigamy Act of 1862, was particularly concerned about Mormonism in the terms that we've been discussing. The idea that it was sort of instituting a mode of theocracy that was incompatible with American modernity. The idea that its institutions of polygamy would undercut the monogamous home and thus also the sort of groundwork of American morality. And so he then articulated or put forth the anti, anti bigamy Act, which was set out to then be able to sort of not only to penalize bigamous relationships or polygamous relationships, but also limit church power and its ability and the extent of its possible land holdings. So this was something then he he sort of put forth, and there was extensive conversation about uh, the Anti Bigamy Act as the first possible national, federal anti anti Mormon legislation in the nation. Stop polygamy, stop the Mormons. Stop polygamy, stop the Mormons. Exactly, using polygamy itself as both a wedge issue, but also as a representative sort of catch all for all of the concerns that Moral and others had. Church and about. state, all exactly. these other things. Yeah, exactly. So. Where, where Boyce comes in is that he also was sort of interested in the passage of the Anti-Bigamy Act, but he suggested that the federal government actually needn't do very much to enforce it because his idea was that upon chartering the Transcontinental Railroad in that same year, 1862, that it would work to similar ends to, again, sort of derail uh, Mormonism, weaken the institutional power of the church, render that kind of federal initiative of the Moral Anti-Bigamy Act unnecessary, superfluous, that railroads themselves would ultimately become sort of agents of the Moral Act and in many ways sort of missionaries in and for the West. So let railroads run their course, he said. Yeah, let was, them do the work of the government. That was a fascinating part of the chapter, the way that you put the Anti-Bigamy Act of 1862 next to the Pacific Railway Act. I never would have expected a railway act to 
be so tied up in discussions of religion. So on the one hand, you have Moral, who is sort of saying, let's legislate and destroy Mormonism. And then you have Boyce, who's saying, no, 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 we can just sort of contain them and, and we'll infiltrate them. We'll have the railroad come through and that will take take care of the problem. Surround them by industry and the problem will take care of itself. Yeah. So they agreed largely on, on a theory of religion and especially the religion of Mormonism. They disagreed on the means of taking care of what they saw as a problem. Right? Yes, that's right. Yeah, and we'll see that throughout throughout the book. In fact, in Utah, Mormons weren't the only ones there. There was people that were not Mormon were often referred to as being Gentiles, outsiders. And your book talks about uh, J.H. Beadle, as we mentioned him a little bit earlier. He wanted to see the rise of a Gentile city of power in Utah mm -hmm. to compete with Salt Lake City and, and other centers of power in Utah. So your book talks about Corinne, a, a little city called Corinne. And you say Beadle, as we mentioned before, is sort of a popular theorizer of religion. What did he want Corinne to become? Yeah, so Corinne imagined that if he – he was reading the sort of the tides of governmental conversation, of industrial interest in the West, and he thought, okay, given sort of po politicians' interest in sort of uh, wrapping industry around Mormonism in order thus to sort of choke out what they would term the Mormon menace, they will surely also be interested in helping to support a Gentile metropolis in Utah. And thus we can – he, as a booster of this would-be town – Corinne, which is about 60 miles north of Salt Lake. And it's still there. Shout out to the Corinians. Absolutely. <laughs> he thought, okay, we will sort of plant this particular town and surely we will attract industry. We will attract governmental support. We will attract missionary support. Miners will come here to work in the mines. Railroaders will come to work on the lines. Corinne itself will sort of build up as a possible metropolis. Presumably, it will also be the major transcontinental railroad hub because surely the corporations themselves will buy into this project. Subsequently, then Corinne will be able to sort of dethrone Salt Lake as the power, the powerhouse of the region, and ultimately Corinne would rise as the sort of major metropolis, the Chicago of the West. And that had big implications, because as Corinne grew, they would be able to control Utah politics. They would be able to control Utah's national politics as well, and and Utah's industries. They would become a hub for transporting goods and transporting people, and it was a big deal. Beetle had a huge vision here. He thought this was going to be like the Chicago of the West, in a Absolutely. sense. Yeah. Absolutely. And we'll talk more about what is going to happen to Corinne. Did Beetle's vision come to pass? We're talking today with David Walker. He's Associate Professor of Religious Studies at UC Santa Barbara, and we're talking about his new book, Railroading Religion, Mormons, Tourists, and the Corporate Spirit of the West. So, so far we've talked about people who were talking about Mormonism. Now, we'll, your next chapter turns to what Mormons themselves were saying and how, how they were dealing with this. So Mormons were aware of the death knell thesis. They were very familiar with the claims that they would wither away and die. And there's a conference that the church held in 1868, which you call the Railroad Conference, <laughs> because railroads played such a prominent theme at this conference. What were Latter-day Saints saying about the death knell th thesis at that time. Absolutely. So this was a conference in October of 1868 held in the Tabernacle where saints and, and uh, Latter-day Saint officials were talking about the railroad thesis, the railroad initiatives of politicians as well as Corinthians. They were fully aware of the sort of Corinthian project and of the work of J.H. Beadle and others. So they came together in part to demonstrate that they were not afraid of of railroads, as, as Brigham Young sort of famously said, I do not care for a religion that cannot stand a railroad, <laughs> or Mormonism would be a blank damn uh, poor religion yeah. if it cannot stand a single railroad. It's like, bring it on. Yeah, bring it on, bring it on. He was interested in the railroads, not only because they would sort of connect saints to sort of broader economies across the nation, but also because they would expedite the bringing of and the emigration of saints to Utah as well. It's quicker than a handcart, quicker than an ox cart. <laughs> and, and also quite a bit cheaper. However, sort of in demonstrating their excitement about the possibility of the railroad, for which they had actually lobbied in a number of other venues beforehand throughout the 1850s, they also recognized that it did indeed constitute or represent or bring a certain set of perils to Mormon institutions as they currently stood. So Mormons had a lot to gain. They, they weren't resisting the railroad. They knew the death knell thesis, but they thought, no, the people are wrong about this. The, the railroad's not going to do it. That doesn't mean that they weren't nervous about some of the things that a railroad might do. What are some of the 
things that might cause a leader like Brigham Young to be a little wary of railroads. So one thing that he was concerned about and one thing that was addressed at great length in this October Railroad Conference was that the connection with transcontinental economies would sort of weaken Mormon economies and it would flood Utah territory with different goods from across the nation and bring sort of outsiders as well who would work on the lines, settle into Salt Lake, weaken perhaps the sort of demographic predominance of the saints, but also perhaps bring cheap labor, cheap materials that would uh, undercut some of the economies of codependence and communalism that the saints themselves had built, built up over the preceding 20 years. So they were welcoming the railroad, but they also were wary about exactly how it would work. And now they were in competition. They were aware of Corinne. They were aware of what their aims were. So this became a competition. And Corinne wanted the railroads to meet near Corinne. That would become the mm -hmm. hub. Latter-day Saints wanted it to be a Latter-day Saint community like Salt Lake or Ogden. How did the church carry the day? Yeah, so let me, I'll, I'll restate part of an answer to an earlier question about what were some of the matters of concern, though, for saints, even as they demonstrated a certain self-confidence about the arrival of the railroad. The concern was that of the sort of arrival of both cheap labor and cheap goods that might compromise some of the systems that Latter-day Saints themselves had built up and perhaps undermine some of the bases of economic codependence and economic self-sufficiency. Now, when the railroads were coming, or one of the ways that that Brigham Young actually sort of swayed the railroads to come to Ogden rather than go to Corinne, and this is this is actually the substance of probably much of the second chapter of my book, is that Brigham Young sort of wooed the railroads not only by by reaching out and offering labor, offering to be subcontractors along the lines of the Union and Central Pacific Railways but also to offer land and to give a land grant to the Union and Central Pacific so that they would ultimately establish their hub in Ogden rather than in Corinne. This would allow them to build like shops, hotels. Is that kind of it? Like an industrial district? Yeah, shops, hotels, roundhouses. Okay. Uh, yeah, some of the sort of the main cape. infrastructure that okay. comes with the connection itself. So, so when Brigham Young then offered a, a large sort of tract of land, it was offered for free in an already approved kind of way that induced in some ways the railroads to settle there. Now, again, Ogden was not the area that the saints necessarily wanted the railroads to go at first. They, they really did want the railroads to connect in and through Salt Lake and perhaps to run a southern route around the Great Salt Lake. Out to the coast. Right, yeah. exactly. But once the railroads realized that that was ultimately not going to be expedient or cost effective to do so, and that they really did need to run a sort of northern route around the top of the Salt Lake, then the, the battle became over one of whether the, the point of connection would be Corinne or somewhere else. So again, the Ogden push was to make sure that it was somewhere else. Ogden was essentially the middle, middle point, the middle grounds between Salt Lake, the sort of Mormon capital, and Corinne, the would-be Gentile capital. It sort of split the difference. And much of the argument then for the book is that the railroads having settled specifically in these middle grounds between sort of Mormon and Gentile economies proceeded also to sort of mediate between them in a number of different respects as time went on. And as we talk about land, so far we've really been focusing on Mormons and non-Mormons, frankly, white Ameri uh, white European and American people, right? Mm -hmm. But your book also talks a lot about, uh, about Native Americans who also had a, a role to play in this. How did Latter-day Saints versus Corinthians view Indians and their any any rights or any say that they would have in in the land or in where the railroad would go yeah so so if we go back to the sort of the the promotional materials of Corinne or the boosterism of a J.H. Beadle or otherwise, he was convinced that, and he was actually quite excited by the idea that uh, Native peoples, especially the Northwestern Shoshone, were eradicated, ridden out, uh, gone from the areas around Corinne, and thus that their the sort of emptiness of the land, as he would as he would cast it, enabled then the sort of filling of that space with the agents of proper white settlement. Yeah. <laughs> 
And now, of course, this was completely and totally wrong. The, the Shoshone groups themselves were still both in the area and continued to sort of winter in the area as well. But his his argument was in many ways an attempt to write uh, Shoshone people out of the history and thus in, and thus indeed to affect their displacement through their rhetorical displacement. Yeah, the uh, railroad would do away with Indians as well. The right? real, absolutely. Yeah. And you find this also in those the political discussions that we were talking about, wherein it was said that railroads would ultimately do away with Mormonism or choke out what was said to be the Mormon menace, is that ubiquitously also the conversation was that of the eradication or the displacement of native peoples throughout the American West. This was the other idea about what sort of American industry and transcontinental connections would bring to the West. It would bring the possibility specifically of white settlement through, again, the, the further displacement of native peoples. One of the advantages that Brigham Young had over the people in Korean was people, people who would listen to him. And so he had the ability to enlist a lot of people to work for the railroad companies, but also people to contribute. So this chapter talks about what women were doing and some of the things that he was asking women to do in terms of contribute. Talk about that for a minute. Absolutely. So this was also sort of a point of conversation in the October Railroad Conference of 1868, but also more generally in, in sort of Salt Lake at the time was... Uh, what work women, Mormon women, could do also to sort of help the Mormon economy and to sort of bolster that economy against what would assume what was assumed to be an onslaught of sort of Gentile incursion. So many women themselves in the sort of rebooted Relief Society and other sort of retrenchment associations tried to sort of to foster self-sufficiency and, and what was called home manufacturers to, to sort of weave, to sew, to put together home manufacturers and, and sort of homemade clothes themselves as well in order then that saints more broadly would not have to import or buy into uh, Gentile markets. Now, that was not the only work that was done. Women themselves also used the rebooted Relief Society as a platform then for prophecy, women's aid work, a number of other sort of initiatives. But this was one of the ideas anyway that Brigham Young very much pushed for the Relief Society and other women's institutions is that they could help sort of mobilize the saints themselves against Again, the sort of Gentile incursion. This contest played out kind of like a race. There's some sense of excitement because you have two railroad companies, one coming from the east, one coming from the west, and they're going to meet someplace. And Corinne and Salt Lake City and Ogden are competing over uh, over where that's going to happen. So there's this ticking time bomb since throughout the book of like who, who's going to carry the day. We're talking with David Walker today. The book is Railroading Religion, Mormons, Tourists, and the Corporate Spirit of the West. David also focuses on intersections of religion, settlement policy, technology, and, and pop culture in the 19th century. So we're talking about the book today. So Latter-day Saints, David, were a source of concern to Americans because they were very unified as well, block voting and, and carrying political weight that way. But in reality, in, in spite of stereotypes of Mormons being completely united, there were also a variety of Latter-day Saints on the ground. Not all of them liked what was happening in their mountain home. So your next chapter talks about some dissident Latter-day Saints here. Who are the Godbeites? So the Godbeites were a group of, as you say, dissident Mormons that also were very excited about the railroad's arrival. I think the chapter, the third chapter of this book starts out with William Godby himself sort of proclaiming and being excited about the transcontinental's arrival as an opportunity for Mormon success in the world. He's a British convert to Mormonism. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Genteel and sophisticated businessman. No doubt. And so he and he and Brigham Young very much agreed on this and were both sort of on the same page, it seemed, about their excitement about the railroad's arrival, right? And its possibility then for the articulation and upbuilding of certain Mormon institutions. It turns out ultimately that they had very different ideas of what that would look like and what the ideal look of a, a righteous Mormon institution of and for modernity would be in the railroad age. So Godby and some of his other sort sort of British convert cohort, ultimately sort of fought back against some of Brigham Young's initiatives of economic centralization, communalism. It's like, we should tap into these markets. Why are we doing home manufacturing stuff? Like, we can get great clothes from the East. What are we doing? I, absolutely. So, the, And the, by the way, I have a store and come on down. 
<laughs> That's true as well. Yeah, so Godbeites were in favor of laissez-faire economics, connection with some of these other people that were coming to Utah, with also sort of fostering connections to mining industry, to sort of working in capitalistic enterprises as well. So they were they were disappointed and frustrated by, again, some of the initiatives that Brigham Young had instituted in anticipation of the railroad's arrival, the Zion's Cooperative Mercantile Institution, for example. Um, or the ZCMI. The ZCMI. Yeah. So Godby indeed, as you rightly say, did have sort of a, a dry goods store that he was trying to push as another sort of opportunity or a place to get goods in this transcontinental era. But he pushed also mining and other modes of laissez-faire economics. He was concerned that Brigham Young had sort of overplayed his his hand as prophet and leader of the church and had, had gone too far into what he called temporalities, what God be called temporalities. He's like, you should be a church leader, not interested in all the business stuff. Exactly. Yeah. So you should work on matters spiritual and yeah. not matters institutional or economic. So that was that was the dissent. That was the nature of the dissent of the Godbeite church itself was to sort of push back against some of the, the Mormon railroading initiatives. And you said the Godbeite church. How did that happen? Because they began as Latter-day Saints. Exactly. So ultimately, the Godbeites themselves did sort of break away from the Mormon church and, and found an alternate church called the Church of Zion in which they sort of promoted some of these economic ideas, but also sort of developed a more spiritualist, and I say that with a sort of capital S, spiritualist mode of Mormonism as well. That is to say, a mode of Mormonism that was in conversation with some of the American spiritualist trends that were developing at that time, but that also like speak, really- Like seances, seances. Like speaking with spirits and communication with the dead and these type of things. Exactly, which Godbeites, rightly in a certain respect, saw as a manifestation of a particular Protestant modernity. And so they themselves... Yeah, this wasn't an archaic throwback. This was cutting-edge religious technology. Because people might think, oh, if the Godbeats are these progressive thinkers, then why are they worried thinking about spirits and revelations in this way? No, that, that was cutting-edge modern religiosity right then. Absolutely. Absolutely. So what Godbeites were all about then was trying to articulate a sort of different mode of Mormonism because they were still claiming the mantle of uh, Mormonism and saying, yeah. claiming themselves to be the right Mormons right. in a for modernity, the right manifestation of Joseph Smith's initial ideas and founding principles as well. And, and so and they, they had a saying, case to make, but Brigham did too, right? Because Brigham was adopting things that Joseph Smith himself, as you talk about in the book, had initiated the, the plat of Zion, like the way that a community was structured, temporal mm -hmm. concerns. Joseph Smith started a hotel, a city. So, you know, Joseph Smith wasn't just this spiritualist, right? Uh, yeah. So Godbeites were grabbing some of the things Joseph Smith did. Brigham Young was doing other things that Joseph Smith did. That was the contest, and it really boiled down to communitarianism versus capitalism, the relationship of the temporal and the spiritual that's right. That's right. And so the argument then is that the railroad and the railroad's arrival very much sort of catalyzed this particular concern or this particular sort of idea of the possibility of difference within Mormonism and the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. What's a specific example of that? Because when you say that, it's like, why the railroad? What could that possibly have to do with this battle? Yeah, so both both groups saw the railroad as a possibility and a venue for the sort of formation of and the articulation of and the upbuilding of and the solidification of particular Mormonisms. They had different ideas of what that would look like in and for modernity. Though. Yeah, so Brigham Young's really such a fascinating figure in the story because he's dealing with a lot of different constituencies. He's got Latter-day Saints who are looking to him as a prophet and a leader. He's got Latter-day Saints who aren't, who are sort of in opposition to some of the programs that he's putting out. He's got Gentile people up in Corinth that are scheming to, to take the influence of the state up north. He's got railroad companies from the east and coming in from the west who have their own monetary interests and their own theories about religion. So there's all these actors in this in this great drama that's unfolding here, and we have the character of Corinne, and the, the city of Corinne becomes sort of a hapless. I, I just feel bad for Corinne in so many ways. That all these things that they're trying sort of fall apart. There's an underlying thread of humor, I think, running through the book and pathos for the, for the plight of the people of Corinne. It's this enlightened Gentile outpost, and it <laughs> sort of reminded me like they're Wiley e. Coyote, and the Mormons were Roadrunner. Like he's. They're, they're trying to get the roadrunner, but, you know, it, it just 
the dynamite blows up in their own face. Talk about the steamboat fiasco as an example of this. Oh, sure. Well, well let me say in, indeed that you rightly, you rightly point out the sort of key in which I try to narrate some of Corinne's sort of failures and difficulties is that at a certain level, if not of necessarily humor, definitely that of irony. So looking always at the ways that more, or excuse me, that, that Corinthians tried to sort of tap into what they took to be national trends and all of the ways in which that ultimately did not pay off for them, right? If anything, it ironically blew up in their face <laughs> yeah, time worse. and time again as they were either outmaneuvered by Brigham Young and others, or as the railroad companies themselves proved not to care about their tiny little outpost of laissez-faire Protestantism, but ultimately proved to be much more interested in the sort of corporate possibilities of connection with the Latter-day Saints of Salt Lake. Right? So at each turn, Corinthians tried to sort of say, okay, maybe we can tap into then sort of the missionary impulses that were spreading across the West at this particular time. Maybe we can tap into the uh, sort of industrial excitement about the spread across the American West. Never, never did these things ultimately work out. And as you said before, too, there's a certain narrative of the first chapter in particular, where the Corinthians, J.H. Beadle especially, kept sort of anxiously looking with much excitement about the, or to the arrival of the railroads, thinking this is it. This is it. Surely they're just going to, they're actually going to follow through on the ubiquitous rhetoric and excitement about sort of Protestant extension and capitalist upbuilding in the American West. But they, but they don't. Again, they don't for a number of different reasons, especially because, again, Brigham Young had both established these corporate relationships with the railroads themselves, and he had in many ways sort of wooed them to Ogden and away from. Yeah, he had people and land. Absolutely. Yeah. He had people and land, and he was able to mobilize both towards railroads. Road connections. That's not going to stop Corinne. They're going to do the steamboat. That's absolutely true. So then Corinne, <laughs> Corinne thinks, okay, we failed in that respect. So, so what else can we then do if Mormons themselves have sort of commandeered the possibility of commerce in and connection to the railroads? And indeed, that sort of proceeded apace as Mormons then built branch railroads to and away from the central transcontinental branch. Yeah, they're like, hey, huh? you can do it in Ogden. We'll just throw a spur down to Salt Lake City absolutely. and we'll, we'll build, build it. Yeah. We'll build a spur from Salt Lake to Ogden will ultimately then build other spurs from Ogden North, yeah. uh, additional spurs from Salt Lake South and West. These spurs themselves sort of gave feeder line traffic to the Transcontinental Railroad and only, if anything, deepened their yeah. sort of corporate relationship and codependency. But in any case, from Corinne's perspective, <laughs> if Mormons had managed to sort of commandeer and, and make good on these railroad connections, then they needed in some ways to look elsewhere, right? So if not railroads, then what? So this was, and, and chapter four looks then at the next place where Mormons, or excuse me, where Corinthians tried to go to upbuild their Gentile capital of Utah, and that was through building a steamboat enterprise. They thought that they could perhaps, if not sort of uh, command the railroads, that they could set up a hub of and for steamboat tourism across the Great Salt Lake. Come on a pleasure cruise. I'm on a pleasure cruise, but yes, also, but that we could perhaps bring those steamboats down to southern the land south of the Great Salt Lake and connect there with the mines yeah. to be able then in some ways to tap those mining trades and be able to pull them away from Mormon branch railroads and bring them up again to the same transcontinental trunks so that those transcontinental companies again would perhaps like us again and they would buy into us again and they would invest in us again if we could find another route by which to bring mining materials to the transcontinental. So it was a, a sort of two-pronged project of trying to use steamboats as a sort of means of uh, mining connection and mining development in the American West, which was seen to be and was largely a Gentile enterprise. And then it was also an endeavor to, to create a sort of touristic capital in, in Utah where where Gentiles might be sort of invited over to take a pleasure cruise on the Great Salt Lake without having to buy into or give money to any of the, the railroads that were seen to be and were indeed Mormon. Mormon. And I have to say, I grew up in Utah. Reading this part blew my mind because never – I guess this goes to show how much – Utah's relationship to the landscape has changed because I I didn't know there were any waterways capable of taking a steamboat from Corinne, which is sort of north of Ogden, just north of Ogden, down past the Great Salt Lake, down to the south side of it, where they could get mining materials and then transport it back up. I didn't even know there were waterways that would ever be capable of doing that, but but they started, they got a boat, 
and they went down there and the mining thing didn't pan out. No, it didn't. And this goes back to your Wile E. Coyote point, because in many ways they didn't uh, really realize the degree to which once you load up a steamboat with ore, <laughs> it's going to be really heavy and you might not be able to get it out into and across the benches of various waterways across the Great Salt Lake. Yeah. So all of this, again, there's a sort of great wah-wah factor where they sort of build up this whole inter <laughs> enterprise with much fanfare oh, and yeah. excitement. Big promotion. That ultimately just runs aground, quite literally, in in one way or another. So, but it was two prong, right? So then you say, okay, they're going to be adept. They're going to shift, and they start this. The, you bring up this really interesting idea of atrocity tourism. What's this? What are they going to do instead of the mining? Yeah. So when mining doesn't pan out, so to speak, uh -huh. for, for a number of different reasons. Yeah, I didn't mean to say. That. Um, <laughs> they try and indeed to sort of build up. Corinne as a as a tourism hub. And they try to do so in sort of positive and negative registers both. So they're aware that the American West is or could be a site of sort of great transcontinental tourism for people who are excited about natural sightseeing, seeing what was said to be the sort of Switzerland of America. There was this great impulse to quote, see America first, perhaps before going over and doing a grand tour in say, Europe or elsewhere. So, so the Corinthians thought, okay, so we can sort of tap into that excitement about Western tourism and sightseeing by again taking people out for these picturesque tours along Great Salt Lake and by thus also again sort of reaping the economic benefits of that excitement. Now, the other prong of that, though, is that as they increasingly realized that, that the tourists that did take these transcontinental trips west were still quite excited and interested in seeing the sort of saints of, of Salt Lake City, they realized that they were going to have to to reconcile themselves to that. They could not ignore the sort of Mormons that tourists themselves were interested in seeing in their ostensible homelands. So what they did then was try to build up a sort of another pitch of tourism, let's say, a negative mode of sightseeing where they could take Gentile tourists out on a tour of the Great Salt Lake, perhaps even bring them to Salt Lake City itself, but in any case sort of shape their modes of, of discourse and the their lines of sight vis-a-vis -vis saints themselves so that they could operate this in what I call the key of negative tourism or atrocity tourism, which is a way of sort of helping tourists themselves to understand themselves as American moderns against what is sort of co-constructed as a negative image of anti-modernity, non-modernity, uh, wrongness. Yeah, we'll create this safe vehicle by which you can go peek in at the creepy Mormons and 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 take a look at all these atrocities and and have a have a drink as you do it. Absolutely, have a nice time. Absolutely, uh, it didn't work as you talk about in that chapter. Tourists were just as interested in hopping on a train with Mormons, putting themselves right into the mix yeah. and experiencing Mormonism firsthand, not just looking at it from a, a boat and probably kind of a low quality boat frankly like sorry corinthians this this was another another misstep by them a big investment that blew up in their face so it, it didn't work but chapter five then takes us to a scene where we kind of join this group of influential non-latter-day saint travelers that are coming to utah and your chapter takes us with them on a tour so we get to see what it was like for people to come through and the different places that they would visit and the ways that the railroad completely bought into this so you talk about uh, what is it, Pulpit Rock or what was? Yeah, Pulpit Rock. Yeah, well, I had never heard of this. And apparently it was a big deal back then. Absolutely. So so this, this is a little bit of a later argument in the book, but it's looking at the ways that railroad companies themselves, having realized that they could sort of capitalize on touristic excitement about uh, Mormonism in the American West, and also having established in many ways a codependent corporate relationship with the LDS church, worked to in some ways justify the, the placement of Mormonism in Utah and to be able to shape then people people's lines of sight around Mormonism to recognize it as a particularly situated and located religion in the American West. This was some of the sort of use value, the utility of Mormonism in the American West. And, the, and according to this railroading model is that you could sort of safely visit this particular group that was geographically bounded in, in this particular area that would nevertheless also help you to understand their role in a nationalizing economy of religion and economics. So some of the ways in which they pursued then this, this work of sort of placing and rendering intelligible Mormonism in and around the, the landscape of Utah was straight up just inventing Mormon sacred sites. <laughs> Um, yeah. 
So this was one of them. Pulpit Rock was a place that happened to be situated along the Transcontinental Railroad. Route. Yeah, the train went right by it. You could it almost right reach out and touch exactly. it, said the promotional materials. Exactly. So what did it, was, it look like? It was it's just sort of this, there. It was this big outcrop, this sort of tower looking a large outcrop rock structure. That, yeah, that you could imagine to be indeed a pulpit. And and pulpit <laughs> rocks were were actually a thing. Okay, in, so this was the Mormon one. Right, exactly, exactly. So there but were they other cooked pulpit up a story. rocks elsewhere, and they were all named basically by the way that they looked. Yeah. But this one just happened to be situated along along the railroad line <laughs> that the Union Pacific took into Utah, and it was good enough by virtue of its appearance and location for a story. So they invented a story. They invented a story about Mormon significance. They said that this was indeed the place where, <laughs> where Brigham Young had first stopped on his trans, or excuse me, his overland trek uh, west in 1847 where he had paused exhausted <laughs> and yet ex inspired by this particularly sublime landscape to stand on the top of this particular pulpit rock which is also impossible the rock is huge yeah you but can't get up there <laughs> to stand on this rock and give his first sermon to other sort of mormon emigrants uh, coming across the plain saying in essence this is almost our place. Yeah. <laughs> we are almost to the It's the this is almost the place speech. <laughs> yes, exactly, exactly. So it was it was fabricated as basically a four Gentiles version of the this is the place speech and Emigration Canyon which was a good 2 days walk away from the railroad line. So so railroad companies invented a sort of substitute experience and place and then encouraged actively the the tourists who were going to pass there at a place where also the grade of the railroad required that the train slow down there. So so yeah. its placement, its grade, its opportunity all gave this particular sort of impetus to create a, a full touristic experience yeah. for tourists at that time where in many ways they could sort of play Mormon. They could imagine what it was like to sort of be Mormons in this particular time at this particular mode, moment of emigration. Yeah, and this is where we see the railroad companies sort of being supportive of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in that there are other stories that they could have told. This is going through Echo Canyon. Around Pulpit Rock, they could have pointed out there were still the remnants of Utah War battlements that Mormons had constructed when they were trying to hassle federal troops as they came through. They could have told those stories, but instead they chose this more ecumenical, inspirational image. They didn't focus so much on the Utah War stuff. It had been years since that had happened. They could have done that. That would have been really exciting and fun, but they, they didn't. As people are coming into the to Utah, then you bring us on this tour, you take us to the tabernacle as a place where Mormonism is performed for the public, where they Mormons have public meetings and invite Gentiles to come and listen. They invite non Latter day Saint preachers to come and talk. They invite discussion, conversation. They, they put their religion on display, the opposite of their temple, where they would, temples in the endowment house, where they would do ordinances out of the reach and out of the sight of the public. So the tabernacle, you talk about the theater, another place. The Mormons had this great theater where people would come not really to watch the, the play as much as to watch the Mormons, to see how many wives they could point out or, or how many strange Mormon families they could. And then, of course, all of the Mormon attendees would watch the Gentiles who were assembled to watch them. It became yeah. a sort of wonderful experience of the mutual gaze. And that happened in Brigham Young's office because you also talk about how people would often stop at Brigham Young office and meet with him and 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 kind of try to f to figure him out but he was doing the same he was doing the same as they would come through and, and talking to them um, and then the Deseret Museum which I tweeted about a little bit this this was a museum that Latter-day Saints came up with to depict Mormonism and to erase American Indian history from Utah at the same time so out of all of these places the tabernacle the theater Brigham Young's house the Desert Museum, which one of those kind of stands out to you? What were you personally most interested in as you did the research? Well, I think they were all incredibly important as a circuit and as a unit. And that's how they were sort of advertised to incoming tourists as well, as you did basically all of these things in succession. You would go to the Tabernacle, a space wherein saints themselves sort of staged elaborate encounters be between Gentiles and Mormons and sort of debates about the nature of the faith for in many ways, with the expectation that visitors would watch that as well. 
they would go to, as you rightly say, Deseret Museum, which was explicitly established as a tourist attraction by John W. Young, Brigham's son, in 1870 to invite people in over the Transcontinental Railroad into a space where Mormons themselves would sort of, again, as in the tabernacle, take charge of the mechanisms and the terms of their own self-representation. All of these things were really important. I do like the Deseret Museum stories quite a bit because I think I think it's really important and part of the the project of the book is, it is to look at the way that John W. Young was a really crucial institution building. This is a son of Brigham Young. Exactly, yeah, how he was in many ways the architect of certain Utah and tourism industries and really did shape the ways in which railroads themselves ultimately represented Mormonism in their own tourism literature. So that goes back also to the conversation about Corinne's would-be steamboats as well. The sort of end of that chapter and and at the end of a sort of narration of cascading failures, we learned that those <laughs> steamboats were ultimately commandeered and bought sometimes through shell corporations by John W. Young, yeah. who then repurposed them at his own resorts because he too was also trying to set up <laughs> tourist resorts wherein he could bring Gentiles and, and foster a different mode of gaze at and for Mormons that was decidedly not happening in the sort of atrocity, the, the tourism, tone of atrocity. Yeah. Exactly. So John W. Young becomes a really important part of this story and also of this particular chapter as we retraverse this particular trip with a number of influential tourists and really look at the ways that John W. Young and others sort of shaped their stay and guided their path through Salt Lake at that time. Yeah, so Latter-day Saints were able to influence public perception of themselves through tourism industry, through the railroad, and railroad companies ended up agreeing that that was good business and, and had an incentive to present a good view of Mormons and of Latter-day Saints. How do you think publicity campaigns influence the church itself? Do you see church leadership and church members being changed by the publicity campaigns? Yes, I think you can see that the the church itself, or at least a number of people within the church, take up some of the materials that were developed in the sort of domain of railroad tourism itself for the purposes of self-representation. This happens in, in small bit with, with Pulpit Rock, although pretty much all Mormons were fully aware of the arbitrary and constructive <laughs> nature of that experience, yeah. but they were still willing to capitalize on it. It's largely forgotten now, I think. Oh, yeah. Was, I had never heard of it. Yeah, I, it's I no longer there yeah. as of the Oh, has it fallen? Or? Or something. Oh, yeah, interesting. They reconstructed the, the road going through there. Okay, well, that's probably why. But also, railroad industries, for example, developed a number of promotional materials that, that likened Utah topographies to to the Middle East and sort of established this geographic parallelism between uh, the Mormon Great Basin and Canaan and the Holy Land. Mormons themselves took up a lot of these promotional materials themselves, which they had not. In many ways, the railroads were, the f were more actively engaged in and interested in fostering a sense of Utah as America's Holy Land yeah. and thus of Utah as a particular place of sort of a substitute Middle Eastern pilgrimage than Mormons themselves were at the mm. time. So in any case, these materials were taken up by the church and by different representatives of the church as mechanisms of self-presentation, too, as time went on. So before we go, I want to ask, what was the ultimate fate of Corinne? I mean, Corinne was never much more than a sort of failed municipal experiment and a sort of hell on wheels outpost. Still absolutely a community, and I don't mean to belie the fact that there are a number of people living in the in the town of Corinne now. I it's mean what's probably wonderful. much different than it was back it's then. It's not yeah. tremendously different than it was back then. There's a, a bar called Mims, which I encourage you to go to and sit down at the counter and ask the waitress or the bartender to tell you the stories of Corinne and they will people so will they gather embrace it there. around absolutely huh. Absolutely. People will gather around to retell the story of how Corinne itself stood up to this massive industrial giant that was sort of Mormonism at the time, failed miserably, but was so sort of like noble in its fight. It's, it's really <laughs> interesting, actually, to see that rhetoric continue and to see huh. the sort of mythos of Corinne itself uh, recirculated in increasingly amplified terms. Frankly, some of the stories that you'll hear now are just like factually incorrect, but they're fascinating <laughs> as part of, again, the sort of continuing story of the possibility of Corinne. 
But the fact is, of course, that with respect to or or in terms of all of the things that J.H. Beadle hoped for and mm. boosted Corinne to be, it was never that. It was yeah. a failure. And so the story then, the, the project of the book, is to figure out how that was so <laughs> and to narrate this project in the key of failure and irony. Yeah. So – Latter-day Saints and railroad companies both wanted to make Mormonism safe and visible for people coming through, but they also didn't want it to lose its exotic draw and its interest. How do you see them splitting that difference? Yeah. Railroading religion could mean railroads rail, like running Mormonism out on a rail. That didn't end up happening. Mormons ended up using railroads and being promoted by them, but they still maybe wanted a little bit of that edge to, to pique people's interest. Oh, absolutely. And this goes back in some ways to the way that railroad companies ultimately settled in Ogden, the middle grounds between Corinne and Salt Lake. Having done that, they proceeded again to sort of mediate between pro and anti-Mormon interests in a number of different venues, including in their promotional materials. So they recognized that in order to make Mormons visible and visitable for tourists at this particular moment, they needed indeed to sort of cultivate still an air of excitement and difference while taking care not to scare away potential potential Gentile travelers. So they're trying indeed to sort of thread the needle here where they cultivate again a sense of otherness, perhaps even exoticism, sort of edge play in, in Salt Lake, even while again they sort of circumscribe that possibility by saying that Mormons themselves are Americans and should be integrated into the terrain of American religious history in certain ways, not least because they provide this certain space wherein Americans writ large can go to think about the nature of religion in modernity. <laughs> Yeah, that's David Walker. He's Associate Professor of Religious Studies at UC Santa Barbara and author of the book Railroading Religion, Mormons, Tourists, and the Corporate Spirit of the West. And David, I also want to point out to people you're here today because you're going to deliver a guest lecture on railroading religion. By the time this episode comes out, we'll have video of that up on the Maxwell Institute's YouTube page. So people should check that out. Again, the book is Railroading Religion, Mormons, Tourists, and the Corporate Spirit of the West. David, thanks a lot for talking to us about the book today. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Thanks for listening to another episode. As I mentioned during the interview, you can catch David Walker's guest lecture at Brigham Young University right now on the Maxwell Institute's YouTube channel if you haven't watched it already. And here's a question. Have you listened to every episode of the Maxwell Institute podcast? If so, we're preparing a special gift for you. You can email me to let me know if you are a completist. podcast at byu.edu. And also please rate and review the show. We're waiting to hear from you. I'm Blair Hodges, and I'll talk to you next time on the Maxwell Institute podcast.